As we continue our study through the book of Hebrews, our scripture reading today comes from Hebrews chapter 5. And so, and it comes with the understanding that Jesus is our great high priest. And with that said, we'll start with verse 11. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This is God's word. Amen. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May we hide our place to the eternal truths in our hearts. Well, I, I trust and pray that you have had a good week. And uh, as you can tell, uh, Pastor Matt and Ms. Connor have taken some time away. And uh, they will be back this afternoon. And uh, Pastor Matt has been preaching over the past two weeks as in this chapter uh, on the great high priest. And so today we are going to continue in this chapter. And uh, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you. Uh, echo what uh, Brother Nick said earlier. I want to thank you for your constant support of the ministry and uh, praying during this time for your family. And I uh, just want you to know that we love you indeed. Well, normally we go, we go into a reminder of context of this, um, of this beautiful book, the book of Hebrews that we began at the beginning of the summer. But today, the message is really geared on context. So we're going to be covering a lot of that inside of the task that we have of looking at this powerful text that Brother Keith just read and um, but often it's a misunderstood text. And I'm, I'm praying today that we will draw some clarity in that. But let me remind you the energy that has been produced by the writer in the, in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, the theme is Jesus is better than angels because he is both God and man. As you read those chapters, that is the thrust. That is his purpose. In Hebrews 3 and partly in, ver in chapter 4, Jesus is better than the servant of Moses because he is the son at, where Moses is the servant of the house. Jesus is the son who builds the house. Also in Hebrews chapter 4, we see that Jesus is better than Adam because he did not fall when tempted. It is also worth noting that Joshua is mentioned. And although Joshua led the children of Israel into the land of promise, only Jesus can bring Sabbath rest to the soul. Now we discuss extensively what that means. It means that only Jesus can bring a soul to the state where they do not have to work in order to get favor with God. Because man cannot get favor with God. Only Jesus can do that. And Jesus has accomplished that. In the latter portion of chapter 4 and then into chapter 5, as we've mentioned, Jesus is better than all the priests, including Aaron. As our great high priest, we learned last week, Jesus was qualified for his office. And he offered up acceptable sacrifice and worship on our behalf to the Father because of His perfect work in His life and His death. And the Father heard His prayers and saved Him out of death through the resurrection. No other priest can make that claim. Jesus is better than all the priests. Now as the writer has been laying out this case for the superiority of Christ, the writer has taken two time out so far. Do you remember what we call those? Parentheticals. Very good. Parentheticals. 
to address particularly a struggling group of people that's in the midst of, of all those who are receiving this letter. And he gives exhortation and warnings. At the beginning of chapter 2, right in the middle of his dialogue on Jesus and angels, the writer warns that when it comes to response in the gospel, to the gospel, no one stands still. Either you are moving towards wholeheartedly trusting and treasuring the new covenant or you are drifting away from it. No one is standing still. And this is the plea by the writer for salvation of these who he is addressing. The second parenthetical comes at the end of chapter 3. And it ran through most of chapter 4 in which the writer is warning recipients about the dangerous consequences that come with tempting God because you're not trusting in him. The test of true genuine faith is whether or not you honestly trust God to do what he promised he would do. Some of these Hebrews that had been listening or even participating in Christian community were considering going back to Judaism. For what reason? We're really not certain. Perhaps it's because of persecution. Or maybe it was just pressure by peers in the, in the community. Or promises from other Hebrews stating that you can get all that they promise in Christianity through Judaism. And it doesn't come with all the opposition. Whatever the case may be, the writer is saying not to be like your parents in the garden, Adam and Eve. Do not be like your ancestors in the wilderness, the children of Israel. They saw God at work and they didn't trust him. Again, the writer in this second time out calls for salvation and evaluation. He's declaring in the midst of all of this, Jesus is better. Don't forget that. Treasure him and trust him. Which brings us to our text today. Pastor Matt concluded last week with verse 10. Which reads, if I can read that for you. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. So if you stop there, you would make an assumption that he is going to continue this journey by even referencing Genesis chapter 14 and learn more about this mysterious figure from the Old Testament. I mean, honestly, how many of us in here consider ourselves experts on Melchizedek? (laughs) But that isn't what happens. Rather now... He enters his third parenthetical. It's like he's, it's almost as if there's this moving in his soul while he is addressing all these recipients to saying, stop. There's something else you need to talk about right now. There is a need in the midst of this congregation or this Christian community. And by the way, do you understand that not everybody who goes to church are true believers? Not everybody who participates in Christian community are true, genuine believers. There's a recognition once again by the writer of this book. There's five total in the book, these parentheticals, these warnings, these exhortations. In the beginning portion of this warning, I believe the writer is giving us the root cause for unbelief. Up to this point, we've seen definitive fruit of unbelief through the exhortations. Drifting, that's a fruit of unbelief. Fear with no trust, that is a fruit of unbelief. We've seen fruit, but in this parenthetical, we see the root. Let's see if you catch it. I want you to put yourself in the context. In a moment, I'll be reminding us more and more of that. Now, if you listened earlier to the reading that Brother Brother Keith did and did a good job reading that, thank you. 
But you probably noticed that in some portions of that text, it was a little difficult to really gather all the thoughts. It, it kind of seemed like maybe this phrase needed to be here and so forth. And honestly, when you look into the Greek, it doesn't really help you quite as much. Now, although I am a pastor... And I have studied and I have um, been tr doing my very best to grow more and more in my knowledge of the scriptures and in theology and doctrine. I have to admit to you that I am more of a simpleton. Sometimes you got to put things a little more simple for me. I'm not real good in English. I hate math. And actually, I love math. I can't take that. I hate science. I'm not, I'm not really good um, at a lot of those things. I have to work. To learn. A lot of, some other people just have the intellectual gene. Pastor Matt is one of those. And I hate him for it. <laughs> no, I don't hate him. I don't even envy him. Because he's weird. And <laughs> See, I get to say all that because he's not here. That's what you get for taking the Sunday off, Matt. So when reading this text, I found it a little difficult to follow. But it doesn't, because it doesn't flow in the English very well. At least for me. I found myself this week staring at the pages, having to read lines over and over and over again. I want you to listen to a breakdown summary that I've tried to put together, keeping the integrity of the original language and also trying to keep the flow of the context in which is coming. And I'm hoping that we're going to, in fact, we're going to put it up on the screen. And I just want to read this to you and see if maybe before we really break this down, it will help us just kind of really grasp what the writer is saying. This is the summarized text. Regarding Christ, who is after the order of Melchizedek, we needed to put that in there because of verse 10. There is certainly more to consider here. Now let me stop. He will consider this. We will go in just a few chapters and we will really dive in deep to the order of Melchizedek and who is this mysterious figure in the Old Testament. However, it is becoming more and more difficult to explain these things to you. Seeing that you are not paying close, atten close enough attention. Honestly... You should be much further along than you are. Even to the point of mentoring others. But that is not the case. In fact, you still need someone to slowly walk you through the absolute basics of God's truth found in the Mosaic Law. We'll, we'll give clarity to that in just a few moments. Basically, you are still like milk babies that are not able to chew their own food. Hear this. That's the four in verse 13. Hear this. Draw your attention to what I'm about to say. Everyone that stays stuck in the milk stage has not experienced the gospel of grace. Now, in verse 13, it's used the phrase word of righteousness. That word of righteousness is a phrase that is classifying the event of salvation. We see that in, in Romans chapter 2 where Paul used and also in other portions of the Pauline epistles. The gospel of grace. If you're in the milk stage, you have not experienced the gospel of grace because he has proven, who's the he? The one who's still the milk baby. He has proven to be weak and infantile. Since solid foods will, um, will only be properly digested by those who have grown out of an infantile state. Did you get that? Solid foods can only be properly diagnosed, I mean, not diagnosed, digested by those who have grown out of an infantile state. You say, what does that mean? I put a little parentheses in here just so we can define that infantile state. Meaning, they are growing in their discernment. Those who are out of their infantile state, they grow in their discernment of what they are eating and are able to chew it up for nourishment. 
it is clear that spiritual milk babies are incapable of discerning good from evil. Good from evil, this phrase here is, means right from wrong. Morally right, morally wrong. What is true, what is false. Milk babies can't do that. He uses this practical analogy to paint this picture. You would think that it would be extremely odd. Let's say you went to Longhorns, okay? I, I like Longhorns, all right? And you go in and you sit down, you sit down and you look across and you see a 45-year-old man, and I just threw a number out there, okay? A 45-year-old man sitting there and the waitress comes and says, what would you like to eat? And he says, will you just bring me a warm bottle of milk? Now, you'd think that would be odd, right? I mean, after all, you're at a steakhouse. You're at a place there's where there's chicken and there's, there's substantive food. And, and it, you're surrounded by adults. He's not sitting in a high chair. So that means that he has been developing physically in life. But his appetite is not changing. You would probably say that that's a little odd. Well, I want you to put on top of that how odd it would be for you to watch him receive his bottle and then sit there and drink from that bottle of milk. You would think that's odd, right? In fact, children think that's odd. Sometimes I, I, I love watching grandparents with their grandbabies. And maybe trying to feed them. And I remember Jaden and Jordan growing up. And you would, you would talk in a baby voice to them, right? And you would, you know, they'd be sitting there. And you're, you're sitting there eating your food. And then, but Jaden is sitting over there or Jordan is sitting there. And I, I remember these times where they would take their, they would have their bottles. And they didn't want their bottles. There was something in them that wanted what was on my plate. But they didn't want their bottle, so what would we do? I would, I would grab it and, and playful, and I'd say, come on, come on. And look, look, oh, it's so good. i go, um, 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 And Jaden and Jordan would look at me like, even at that age, they're like, that, something's not right with that. <laughs> it's common sense. As you grow, as, as time progresses... You're putting the milk down. Now, milk can still be a part of your, your diet, right? I love milk. I had a nice tall glass last night with a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> and it was wonderful. I love milk. Now, it doesn't love me, but I, but I love milk. But I can't stay on milk. I've got to, I've got to have substance. I've got to have calories. I need fat. I need carbs in the right proportions of course okay but I need I need those things and the writer of Hebrews is painting this picture that there are a group of people who have had adequate time to get off the milk but they're not doing it and sadly today we would think it would be peculiar for someone to only drink milk if, they have, if they're older and they're developed. In fact, if we don't know the individual, we would probably say something's wrong, right? That brings us to our main focus today. I want to draw clarity because it would be very easy for us to preach a sermon here to Christians and say, get off the milk. After all, the Apostle Paul said that. And so we'll, we'll address that a little bit more. But I want us to answer a few questions in our main focus so we can have clarity of this. Because this parenthetical is not just these three verses. It goes into the latter portion of chapter 6. This is a very, very serious warning 
that begins with an analogy that oftentimes is misunderstood. And because we misunderstand this sometimes, Christians misunderstand the entire warning. So let's draw clarity to this. Number one, I want to answer the question, to whom was this, written, was this warning written? To whom was this warning written? Context, remember context is king. You got to start with context. Context says that it is to Hebrews who are familiar with and partial to Jewish history and law. That's the original context. They're familiar. I mean, he is, he is able to give insight about Moses. He's able to talk about angels. He's able to talk about the priesthood and so forth. And so already. So they're, they're familiar with history and with the law. But also, I want you to understand the context tells us that they are Hebrews that are engaged in a type of Christian community as we talked about earlier. This isn't street preaching that's going on here where it's like it's just whoever comes up. This is being written for a Christian community, for Hebrews who have converted from Christianity, but also in the midst of them, there are people, remember, who are riding the fence. They've intellectually said, yes, all right, all of this sounds great and it's maybe even appealing to them because remember what Jesus said the Pharisees had been doing and the Jewish system had turned into this great heavy weight that they could not bear. There was so much law, so much law. It's like they, they were feeling that they were set up to fail. And now Christianity has come along and it says, wait a minute, you're telling us that there's a possibility that the Messiah has come and he has already bore the weight of the law for us? Ooh, this sounds easy. Let's come into this Christian community and learn even more about this. And they're riding the fence and they're seeing the positive points, but they have not surrendered to the full Allegiance to the Lordship of Christ. And then there's also those, as Paul would warn, of, there's true about every church. And this is one of the reasons we have, and this is one of the primary responsibilities of pastors. Is to protect the flock from wolves. Is to shepherd you and protect you from wolves. Recognizing that there were wolves in the Christian community. We already acknowledge together that there are individuals that profess Christ that come to church, but they are not true, genuine believers. Now, that can be scary to us, but that is true, and we will draw clarity to that because I, wanna, I don't want anyone here, because my goal is the same as the Hebrew writer here. My goal is not for a genuine, sensitive believer here to get worried about, oh, I don't know if I'm saved and I, I, all of this. No. That's not the goal. The goal here is to shine light and expose those who aren't saved. Because they have not placed their full allegiance into the Lordship of Christ. That is our context. Familiar with and partial to the Jewish history and law. And also, they are engaged in a type of community. Maybe they attend the worship gatherings. Maybe they occasionally go to a small group. Maybe they, have, they go out to eat sometimes with some of the people in the church. Maybe they've developed some relationships. They're engaged in a type of Christian community. That is what context tells us about whom was this warning written to. But the text goes even deeper. So we're going to look at context. Now let's look into our text of whom this warning is written to. The text says that it is to Hebrews, and I'm going to list these off, okay? And, um, and I'm going to I'm, I'll do my best to try to point them back to the text for you, okay? Number one. Hebrews that are becoming more and more disinterested in the writer's message. All right. Look back with me in verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and it's hard to utter, seeing that you are dull of hearing. Now, what is the opposite of dull? Sharp. 
You know, sometimes you see a guy and you know, you're like, man, that's just a sharp guy. He, you know what? He is on the spot. He is just keeping it together. He is intentional. All right? We, that's what we think about. But if we say dull, sloppy, careless, not real intentional. How about a wanderer in their minds? That is, that is what's taking place here. As he's going through angels and he's going through Moses and he's going through the priesthood. And he's, and he's bringing all this together. And even in the midst of these warnings that are coming, he's saying this. You're be, there's some of you that are becoming more and more disinterested. You're not paying close attention to what is being said. Secondly, Hebrews that are intellectually spiritually and morally lazy. Look back in the text with me. It says that, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, that means there should be some intellectual foundation that you have in your life, but you have need of a teacher. Now you say, where did you get intellectual, spiritual, and moral from that. Well, because first of all, we're talking about something extremely spiritual. In fact, I want you to understand today that the most essential element of your life is not your physical well-being. It is your spiritual well-being. And that comes from your mind and from your heart. What you know to be true and what is validated by what is taught to you through the teachings of God's Word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. So it is spiritual when someone neglects the learning of God's Word. Right? You with me? You tracking? It's just beyond me. It is beyond me. And, I, and I'll tell you, because I've struggled with it sometimes, and I got convicted about it. That there are times that I tend, I'm in a service, and you know what happens? I don't know if I nod, but I do kind of, my attention gets diverted. That ought not to be so. If I need to take medicine so I can focus in service... I'm going to take medicine so I can focus in service. And pray that God will do a work in me to wean me off of that. But I'm going to do whatever it takes. I need to be fixed in on the Word of God. It is God breathed. And it is for you today. There is nothing. Get this. Nothing more important than what is going on right now in this world. The President of the United States could have an emergency press conference right now declaring war with another country and it still wouldn't be more important than what's going on right now. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. you think a lot of yourself has nothing to do with me, has everything to do with him and his word. If the President of the United States was here and giving a speech and he came and I was amazed several years ago Whenever the president came to Greenville and how passionate people were at the rally. And they were hanging on every word. Some of them were bad words. Okay? All right? Okay? And they were hanging on every word. Why can't we be that way about God's word? Why can't we be that, be that way, knowing that the God of this universe who is sovereign over all has lovingly given you His very essence, His Word, to reveal to you more and more who He is. I'm sorry. No political candidate, no basketball player, no celebrity is worth that. God is worth it. It is spiritual. And it's moral. You say, Blake, why are you so passionate about that? Because it hit me like a ton of bricks this week. It is an 
is an immoral act to be sidetracked when the word of God is being rightly divided. And he says that this is a, he says that you've had time. You should be teachers now. You should be mentoring people by now with all that has been taught to you. You should have intellectually that. But you don't. They are intellectually, spiritually, and morally lazy. The text also tells us that they are ignorant of the basic points of the Old Testament. That goes back to point two. But he's saying here, you're ignorant about the Old Testament. And these are Hebrews who have been brought, who who have been learning the Torah, who have been learning the law. And so they may be able to say, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, but they don't understand the point of the Old Testament. This, this writer has been laying out this groundwork of the Old Testament. See, the Old Testament was pictures. It was pictures of Christ coming. That's why you read the Old Testament in light of the gospel. You read the Old Testament in light of Christ. That's why you're not David. We've said that before. You're not David. Christ is David. He's the one who slayed the greatest giant of them all, sin. So that you, so his people could be spared. We, we go through and we see, we see pictures of Christ all the way through the Old Testament. And these people have been hearing this. These Hebrews have been hearing this message over and over and over again. And they still don't get it. They still think that the Old Testament is about do's and don'ts. They think it's about some way of gaining favor with God. Next, these Hebrews, these are Hebrews that have been exposed to teaching for an extended period of time. He said, by now you should be teachers. So we're not talking about people who have just come in and they've heard the gospel one time. We're talking about people, if we're going to put it in our context, that week in and week out, week in and week out, they come under the teaching of the Word of God and they hear the gospel clearly taught, the Word rightly divided, and they get up and they leave. They get up and they leave and they don't apply and there's no change in their lives. This is an experience, I mean, wouldn't you say, I mean, there is sad. We talked about the, the older gentleman that drinks the milk at the steakhouse. Listen, it should be weird and concerning to us when people have been in church for 30, for 35 years, and they're still as immature as the day they first stepped in it. That is concerning to us. Well, let me give you two more, okay? These are Hebrews, according to this text, that are not developing at all. There is no progress with them. So I want you to stop for a moment, okay? And I want to give you an overview of what has been said in this text. These are Hebrews that have become more and more disinterested with the writer's message. They have been intellectually, spiritually, and morally lazy. They, have been, they are ignorant of the basic points, just the basics of the Old Testament. They have been exposed, and they've been exposed to teachings for an extended period of time. Enough time to where they should be getting this stuff. And there is absolutely no development in their life. Now, I want you to let logic and the text offer a verdict on these Hebrews. These Hebrews are not saved. The text says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful 
in the word of righteousness or the gospel of grace. They haven't experienced it. They've seen some of it. They've heard little sprinkles of teaching. They've seen some things that they like about it, but they have not experienced it. Now, this is a little scary. Honestly, the whole notion that people can be in a, in a congregation, they can be in a Christian community, and they can even believe themselves thinking that they are saved. Now, can I stop there for a moment? They're not thinking that they're saved because of Christ. They're thinking that they're saved because of what they're doing. You see? Now, I want to draw clarity to the very fact that babes is mentioned because some would say, well, what about the term babes? Isn't that referring to immature Christians? Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, I, brethren, couldn't speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes. But is that how it finishes? No, no. Even as to unto babes in Christ. There's a distinguishing that Paul makes. I fed you with milk and not with solid food for this time. You were not able to bear it. Neither were you, are, are you now able. You see, it proves right there. New Christians are called babes, but they're called babes in Christ. But then there's the other one. What about Peter? You say, Paul says, it can be a little confusing. Paul says, don't mess with the milk. Peter says, go get the milk. You say, that's a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. Paul simply uses a metaphor of a baby and milk in one way, and Peter uses it in another way. That's the only difference. Peter is saying, you know how a baby, when it's hungry, wants, wants the milk and nothing but the milk? It cries for the milk. It yearns for the milk. It hurts for the milk. Peter is saying, that's the way Christians ought to be about the Word of God. They should be about the Word. And wanting the word. And only the word. And nothing else in their life will satisfy them. Like the word will. Just like a baby will not be satisfied. Until it has the milk. That's Peter's analogy. Paul's analogy is taking a baby as a baby saying, You ought to grow up. The term babes isn't a definitive term for Christians. It does sometimes mean Christians, but we should be, and we should be mindful of that. And those sermons will preach, and they are appropriate when they're in their proper context. But context and text here determines that context and the text must agree with a description. And here it seems to suggest that the babes, that the term babe is a negative term. For one that has been constantly exposed to biblical teaching and is not moving towards embracing Jesus as Lord. That's who this warning is written to. But number two, what is the concern of the writer? And I will hasten with this. The context says that these Hebrews were considering going back to what was familiar and comfortable to them. Can we stop there? Um, let me reference, and we're going to go into chapter 6 now. It says, therefore, remember the, the word therefore is a pivot, based on what was just said, now coming into another thought. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ... And go on to maturity or completeness. That's a better translation. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith towards God. And of instruction about washings or the, some interpret that as baptisms. 
the laying on of hands, the, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These people were, were looking back and they were staying fixed on the things they had learned in Judaism and they were familiar with it and they were comfortable with it and they said, this is just easier. Maybe we should just go back to this. We thought this was going to be easier, but it turns out we're kind of like, we're just in this flow with Judaism and maybe this would just be better for us. Has that not happened in the church? Folks come and maybe emotionally charged or maybe they're just thinking that I'm looking for something or maybe, maybe because they've struggled or they've had circumstances in their life and they come and they, they're embraced by a community of believers and, maybe, and they, they come in and they come for a while but then they say, you know what? Maybe this isn't what I was looking for. Or maybe they're not even that brash to say that out loud. Maybe they just start or maybe they just stop coming. You don't see them one week. Hey, we missed you. And so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had this going on. And maybe they did. But then the next week. And then the next week. And now weeks turn into months. And months maybe even turn to years. And maybe sometimes just for peace's sake, they come just every once in a while. Just to kind of keep the preacher off their back. Or to keep the people off the back. To keep the phone calls and the text messages from people that are loving, trying to love on them. We see this of things that are familiar to us and comfortable. Sometimes we see people choose those things. That's context. The text says that these Hebrews were becoming satisfied with their lack of discernment. They were fine with ignorance. You say, but like, what is the concern of the writer based on this text and the parentheticals before it and also what is about to come down the pike in this parenthetical? The writer is simply saying to these people, you're going the wrong way. You should be going this way towards Jesus. But you're not. You're going this way. So what, number three, what is the writer's plea? Contextually, we say it every week. Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. Textually, he tells them that we need to grow in the gospel. These people, of course, were holding on to their Judaism. He says you can't lay just on the foundations of Judaism. You can't hang on to the Old Testament. You just can't hold on even to the Word of God in the Old Testament. You have to go on. You have to move. You have to pursue. You can't hold on to the elementary teachings about the Messiah. That's a reference to the Old Testament teachings, not the New Testament. About Christ. You can't hang on to those things. In fact, he mentions six things. Let me... Just list those for you and draw, draw some clarity. He said, repentance from dead works. What he is saying is, repentance is a critical part of salvation. But by itself, it can't save you. I know a lot of people who feel bad for doing things that are wrong. I've even met a lot of people who, who say, you know what? I'm going to turn over a new leaf. That's the picture, isn't it, of repentance? It's not just sorrow for what is wrong, but turning from it. I tell you today, he says, repentance from dead works is not enough. But then he says, faith towards God is not enough. What? I mean, it's good to have general faith towards God, but it's not enough. Jews believed in the true and living God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of creation. The God of redemption. They believed in the true God. But it wasn't enough. He then said the instructions about washings. What was this? He's saying that these were, these were Old Testament purification rites and ceremonies. He says you can, you can still do all the rituals and all of that. But that's not enough. He said the laying on of hands. 
You say, what is that? Some had referred to this as, a, as an ordination or a, a practice that was going on in the church. But remember, the context here is he's trying to pull them out of just leaning on the Old Testament. Leviticus 1.4 teaches us that they who brought the sacrifice to be offered, the person who brought the sacrifice would put his hands on the sacrifice. The putting on the hands of the sacrifice was a way to identify with the substitute that was dying. It's a beautiful picture of the Messiah. So that refers to the sacrificial system. And then it says the resurrection of the dead. The Old Testament taught the resurrection of the dead. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust thee. Why? Because though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job had the hope to see God. David's little baby died. And his hope was, I will go to him. He had hope of eternal life. Then there's the fear of eternal judgment. He says all these things are not enough. You can't just lay again the foundations, the basics, the elementary teachings. Repentance of your dead works. Faith towards God. Washing, sacrifices, the belief in the resurrection. Fearing eternal judgment. That's not enough. What do you mean it's not enough? You have to recognize who that is pointing you to. And that is Christ. You must believe that Jesus Christ has taken the full penalty for your sin, satisfied the just eternal judgment required of God, and will grant salvation and forgiveness to the one who comes to him in faith. So what is the plea? Grow in the gospel. Don't get stuck in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not bad. The Old Testament is essential because it points us to Christ. But the second thing, he says, pray for sovereign grace. The writer says in verse 3, I love this, how human responsibility and sovereignty collide, mesh, and intermingle and create something beautiful in salvation. It says, and this we will do if God permits. You need to recognize today that salvation is a work that only the Holy Spirit can do in you. See, that, that will check us some because what do we sometimes do? And when I say we, I'm talking about those who assemble. We, we hear a plea. We hear the message. We hear it clearly explained. And what we say, maybe next week. What we're saying is, not if God permits, if I permit. It's all on me. What is the writer, the summary of the writer's plea here? Grow in the gospel, pray for sovereign grace. Basically, this. Remember what his concern was? You're going the wrong way. His plea is turn around. You don't understand because of what's coming. You don't understand what is awaiting you if you don't. But that's for the next time, Lord willing. Let me give you the conclusion very quickly. At the beginning of our study in the parentheticals, we've referenced the parable of the souls. And I'm, I am reminded of the words of Jesus following his explanation of that parable. And it's very important here. He had finished telling the parable and explaining it, and then he said this, Therefore, take care how you hear how you listen for whoever has to him shall more be given and whoever does not have even what he thinks that he shall 
be taken away from him. In other words, if you have the grace to hear with faith and fruit, you will get more grace. But if you do not, even what you think you will be taking away from this, namely the word, you think you have the word, it will be taken from you one day. And now I plead with you. I plead with those who are listening, those who are watching, under the sound of this voice, be diligent and earnest in how you hear. Lazy, drifting, passive, dull listening is incredibly dangerous. And even now, at this very minute, it all leads to destruction. Alistair Begg said this, Ignorance and laziness sleep in the same bed. So how do we apply this? You say, Blake, I'm a believer. How do I apply this? Well, first, let me take a moment to address anyone who has not been grasped by grace. If you are an unbeliever today, what can you take from Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 14, and then 6, 1, 2, and 3? Please know that you are graciously being given opportunity to hear. But there comes a point where you will become dull in your hearing. And you should not keep delaying and denying. That's the warning to the unbeliever. To the believer, we should not only be encouraged that God is doing a work in, our, in us to make us more like his son. All right, we should be encouraged in that, right? But that's not the only thing in sanctification. But also... We should be challenged to pursue meat and maturity and completeness. I pray today that all of this has fallen on good soil.